education, and future making. He has held faculty positions at the University of Belize and Glayland University and has been a GK faculty at the University of Toronto, University of Belize, and University of Manitoba. He has a long history of involvement in indigenous movements in Belize and Central America and has been involved in the development of indigenous and intercultural education in Belize. He's taught, written, and presented on topics including the colonization of education and development, indigenous governance, and education and indigenous knowledge and reinsurgence. He is currently founding advisor at the Center for Engaged Learning Abroad. So that's our first panelist. Uh, our second panelist is Runako Greg. He's a grassroots activist and human rights lawyer who began his career in Ontario, Canada, but is now based in Trinidad and Tobago. He has worked as a policy an analyst and a litigator, appearing before various levels of courts and boards with a specialty on race and racial profiling. As a researcher, Runaku interests include political economy, colonialism, gender studies, and revolutionary thought. And we have Mr. Aaron Kamugisha. So sorry that I butchered that. Kamugisha. He's a professor of Cultural Studies at the University of West Indies, Cape Hill campus in Barbados. He is the author of Beyond Coloniality, Citizenship and Freedom in the Caribbean Intellectual Freedom, as well as several indispensable volumes of Caribbean political thought. So after, since I've introduced our panelists, I'm gonna jump right into our first question. Um, given the state of the world right now, with everything going on from global trends of tearing down monuments uh, to the uprising of anti-black racism and police brutality in America, also coupled with the COVID-19 global health pandemic that you know, our, our world has been going through. What are you thinking, for the panelists, what are you thinking about in terms of commemorating Emancipation Day in 2020? Runako, I'll ask you to go first. Um, <laughs> you're like the first person that's right beside me, and yeah, please. Okay, um, I think before we, we talk about like commemoration, it's important to really situate um, where things are right now in the context of um, the Black Lives Matter movement happening throughout the United States and all for all intents and purposes, the world. And um, to look at, and, uh, and obviously along with the, the COVID pandemic, and just to, to try and, and think um, about specifically how, how it, it affects each part of the world. So um, it, it, it will mean something um, different for, for North America than it does for the continent of Africa and, uh, or, or that it does uh, in the Caribbean. So, so I would just say, like, to perhaps give some background in terms of what is happening or what has happened in the last uh, few weeks here in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and, uh, and and in terms of Black Lives Matter becoming topical here, um, there. I mean, there are a couple of things. First, again, you know, seeing the seeing the um, the, the the video footage of. George Floyd being killed by um, by the police in Minnesota, it it it, it made a lot of people um, upset, indignant, frustrated, all those things. And um, people here, at least I could say in Trinidad and Tobago, there were groups of people that wanted to uh, show their solidarity with 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 um, people who were protesting in the United States. And and so there were some protest actions, some small actions to begin with. Um, then there was some more uh, a larger action in relation to a colonial statute of, of Christopher Columbus um, that the, uh, the indigenous, well, at least one indigenous community here in Trinidad and Tobago um, was advocating to have removed. And um, they, they protested down at City Hall in Port of Spain here. And, you know, it, it was... Uh, an, an issue um, of 
I suppose people question why is this statute still up? Just like they question why these statutes are up all over um, these spaces in, in North America and, and in Europe. And so there was some protest action around that. The people had had presented petitions. And in fact, they, they, um, there have been groups that have been advocating for the removal of that statute, which is in Port of Spain, for, for, for several years now. So you had that happen. Um, but in terms of the, the, the uh, police brutality, like really hitting home, uh, that took place a few weeks ago, about three or four, or four weeks ago, in um, one of the, I guess, the largest working poor and working um, class neighborhoods in Trinidad and Tobago, an area called Mova and Lavantil. Um, and that was a situation where uh, you had three young men who were stopped by the police in a car and um, they, were f they were fired upon and killed, all three of them killed. And this sparked outrage. And it sparked outrage not because it is uncommon for police to kill, um, you know, people in Trinidad and Tobago, because dozens of people are killed by the police in Trinidad and Tobago every year. Uh, and in fact, at higher rates than you have in the United States per capita. So, but what made this, this incident unique was the fact that there was actually uh, um, video footage showing um, the incident. And, and you could see one of the guys came up with their hands up and, and you know, they were, and, and ultimately this person was killed. And so were the, the, the two people who, was, who remained in the car. And so uh, a protest Hello. began soon after that because a lot of people said that, you know, he came out, he said, I am... You, you know, I, I, I just, I just, you know, I just live over there. You know, this is not a big, shouldn't be anything big. I shouldn't be stopped. And then he was ultimately killed. So, and the the the, the, uh, the following day, you know, the media visited the neighborhood and people were saying like this was unjust. And then the residents came out and they started throwing debris onto the street. They blocked the, the road, tr just trying to seek attention, trying to, 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 to um, scream out against this injustice. And that incident resonated with other working class and working poor communities in this, um, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, sp specifically like neighboring areas. So yeah, so the incident happened in Mova. Um, you know, you know, uh, uh, you have Lavanti, which is next to Mova, and they were, they were protests there. South of of, uh, of Lavanti and Beatum Gardens, there were protests there, and then um, in East Port of Spain, Silas, there were protests there, and so within a few days, actually less than a few days, it it started in Mova and then it moved on to these other areas, and then people came into the streets, into the hundreds, in fact, protesting against what happened, and obviously the the the, the historical moment, the um, the fact that you have these protests happening all around the world really push people to, to get into the streets and, 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 and protest against what was happening. And, and, and also starting to make connections in terms of um, the fact that, that these are also neglected communities in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, so a lot of that energy were, were, was put out there. People were making signs on cardboards and stuff like, like that. Nothing too fancy, and you saw a lot of young people coming. But then, what you also saw was a lot of repression by the police. The police um, tear gassed uh, the protesters. You had uh, over seventy people were were arrested, um, and the police in very militarized looking gear. Uh, essentially, you, you know, we we saw video footage of them intimidate, intimidating. Protesters, and then on top of that, you also saw um, a protester was also shot, uh, and um, while in the police presence, I mean, they, they have yet to de determine whether or not the, the police fired the shot that killed this protester. Um, but 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 that was um, one of the major reactions that happened uh, as a result of the initial killings in in um, in Mova. Now. In terms of thinking about this 
all of these things that are happening and, and, and what it means for, for um, you know, emancipation and how to commemorate it and, and all of that. One of the things that I think really stands out is how far away we are from this, this idea of real emancipation. Because what, what was very evident in a lot of the discourse that came out during um, the, uh, the protest actions, a lot of people uh, in different parts of the um, country, whether on, well, typically on social media, were coming out and saying um, that these individuals who were protesting were kind of good for nothing. They um, they just piggybacking on things that happened in the United States. They were denigrated in a, in a lot of ways. And, and, and the discourse around um, even the, the communities themselves, the people from these communities, were um, was a language that, that was clearly embedded in a kind of like classes um, projection or pro classes classification, I should say, and, and as well as anti-black racism as well. And you know, the although you have a situation in Trinidad and Tobago where most of the police are people of African descent um, or, or, or black um, more generally. You have, you, you know, and people were saying, well, how could it be anti-black racism when you, when the police are, are, are themselves black and, 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 you know, so, so it couldn't be a situation like that. So what it shows is, is that there's a lack of understanding of what anti-black racism is and, and, and the, the, the ways in which it is so embedded in our structures and our systems. And um, so trying to, to, you know, and, and also the extent to which we're still in a, in a colonial situation, right, where you have these, uh, you know, aggressive, um, this aggressive police force who is coming into these, these working poor and working class black communities and constructing the people who live as if they are threats, like as if they um, um, are criminal, they are, they are the ones that are aggressive, they are the ones that, that need to be controlled. And um, they, they, there's, there's almost an acceptance of that here, where you have people saying, well, yeah, like the, that is where all the crime is, and that is where all the, the killings are, and that is where the drugs is, and that is where, where, where the guns are. And so these, these characterizations are, are very much um, fit within uh, you know, a particular colonial discourse that has yet to uh, dissipate in the year 2020. So, so for, for emancipation um, 2020, I think it's really about thinking how far we need to go and, and how much work actually needs to be done in order to reach the point of, um, of being free. Because if we, as, 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 um, you know, living in the, the Caribbean especially, are unable to, so for example, like even with the, the, the Columbus statue, you have people who were criticizing um, the, like protesters who wanted the removal of the statue. They say, you know, that statue here for so long, like why you want to remove it now? And, and without really thinking about how much we uh, are still tied to this history of, um, of genocide of the indigenous people, acting like 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 if this this symbol is not an affront to, to, to the whole, um, you know, like, like the, 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 the the destruction or the genocide against that people. I mean, there are people, indigenous people here, and, and and for them to have to like see that and be reminded of that, you know, and and then you have others who will say, well, that is not a big thing. Like we have other problems to deal with. Like if removing a statue is is so much trouble. Right, so I, I, um, I think for, for, for emancipation is, is recognizing that we still haven't dealt with the legacy of um, colonialism, specifically the genocide of indigenous people, uh, the enslavement of African people, the exploitation um, through indentureship of, of, of the, uh, the East Indian population in, in Trinidad and Tobago, and other forms of, uh, of oppression that still exist for the benefit of the few within um, a global capitalist system and, and, and that, of course, 
uh, validated by a white supremacist structure. So we have we haven't come close to to really uh, interrogating these um, these systems. And so I think Emancipation 2020 is about trying to get to that point and and, and pushing ourselves to um, to engage in these 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 discussions and, and ultimately um, do something about uh, changing the status quo. Yeah, that's so, so much beautiful things that you said there. But just, just as an extension to your last part, I think about that a lot when Justin Trudeau, um, you know, when those pictures of the blackface surfaced. Um, and so many people did, did not actually understand what blackface was. And so it was this conversation of, oh, it can't be that serious or, oh, it's celebration. It's but you don't actually know what the history of blackface is, right? So, and I and I just tie that back into kind of what you're saying of, of the fact that we as a society need to be educating ourselves. Our social consciousness needs to be raising and we need to be working alongside one another to be teaching each other about things like anti-black racism and why people like Columbus should not be celebrated. Um, because yeah, that's kind of where the work starts. Um, and I wonder if we kind of skipped over that um, or if a part of, you know, the revolutionary process right now, if we've been kind of speeding past that, that, that step of education of sitting with folks and just kind of explaining, you know, why we're here and where we want to go. Um, so thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Um, whoever would like to go next, please. Hmm. I Okay. Um, Filiberto, did you want to go next? I, I, I can. I'm happy to. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Renako, for those uh, wonderful, you know, contributions and uh, those insights. I think is, it, it's really some very important issues. And I think what I have to share really, I think, uh, resonate with that. I mean, I think we recognize that. Um, you know, when I uh, see what's going on with the, you know, Black Lives Matter, what happened, in, what's happening in the U.S. in terms of the police brutality and anti-black racism, um, really, it, it's for me, like Renako said, kind of a reminder that uh, much of the logic that justified racism, that you know, underpin colonialism, is very much alive. It's alive in our institutions and really it's alive in, in, in our ways of thinking uh, for both uh, white people as well as even us indigenous and black people, right? I mean, we also have that. Runako said, you know, uh, when people think that there is a police uh, forming violence against another black body, that, that okay, well, that cannot count as anti-black racism. Uh, but what is motivating that, okay? And what is the institution that the person conducting the violence represent. So to me, uh, it, it suggests, you know, it's clearly evidence that um, that logic uh, is still very much present and really that there's a lot that needs to be done. There's no doubt that a lot needs to be done. And I think Renaka has pointed out as well. But also seeing the kind of activism that, that uh, is going on, right, the, the, the fighting back, it also shows me that the spirit, I think, of our people Black people, Indigenous peoples, you know, it, it is it is very much alive, and that there's a tremendous resilience despite this ongoing negative forces. We are here and we're fighting back. I mean, that doesn't take away from the fact that there's tremendous uh, negative forces, but I think it's also important to recognize and celebrate uh, the fact that we fight back. Okay, uh, whether it is Indigenous peoples. Uh, in, in, in Mexico saying, ya basta, or, you know, um, enough, you know, or, or Black Lives Matter, so you're seeing all of this kind of activism. And I think it's important to recognize that. Much needs to be done. We're doing a lot, but much needs to, needs to be done. Um, you know, I kind of am reminded of, of this, this logic, right, of, of uh, colonialism that sort of there's a, an absolute, absolute certainty about the humanity of white people. You know, we, we are, we're humans, okay? 
and a doubt right, about the humanity of others, of black and brown people. And I think that is still there. It, it is something, you know, I, I've uh, recently been reading um, Luis Maldonado uh, Torres, and he, he has this concept of misanthropic skepticism, right? Which basically says that's kind of one of the underlying uh, uh, thoughts uh, for colonialism, the certainty of, of white humanity and the doubt, the skepticism about the humanity of others. And that, that essentially kind of justifies uh, dispossession, that makes, renders some bodies uh, disposable, you know, rapeable, killable, you know, uh, brutalizable, you know, it, it, it sort of justifies that. And he also talks about how um, one of the things that uh, has happened is the institutionalization of uh, what he calls the non-ethics of war. Basically, the kind of violence that you see in war became institutionalized in the Americas, right? Where all of these bodies, it's okay to dispose of them, and it justifies certain people's lives, you know, being much more important, uh, you know, at the expense of others. And I see that very much present today. Um, you say it obviously in, in the U.S. in the recent kind of events, but you also see it, for example, when the, the lands of indigenous peoples are invaded, you know, uh, where their lands, their aspirations, their future is sacrificed at the this altar of of development, this altar of of progress. Uh, so you see it very much alive there as, as well. Um, even during the COVID pandemic, you know, something very simple. Uh, here in Belize, uh, there was a lot of a lot of burning happens around. Um, you know, during the COVID pandemic, um, there's a lot of burning that happens in the months of March and April, and so the government of Belize uh, said, okay, you know what? Uh, no burning needs. To, uh, they pass a law that says that there should be no burning. Okay, and without giving thought uh, to the fact that for some Maya farmers, it is important, obviously burning is demonized, right? But no thought is given to the fact that if you do not clear your land and if you do not burn it, because you're doing green harvesting, uh, farming, if you do not do that, then three months from now, you have no food. But that's not in the logic of the thinking of say the agriculture department, whoever is developing the laws. Those lives do not matter. Those ways of thinking, those ways of being, knowing and doing do not matter. To me, that is very much present and it shows you the kinds of things I think that we really uh, need to engage in. Now, for me, I work with indigenous peoples uh, a lot and, and um, in, in Belize and I see uh, some of the work needs to be done. Obviously, the question of land rights and securing those are really important, but also sort of like imagining uh, a, an alternative future, a future that is based on a different kind of logic and that's what really excites me. And that to me, so Emancipation Day, you know, Emancipation 2020, for me, as I said, is a reminder of the fact, you know, that that logic still persists and it's present in different kinds of ways, um, but also a uh, time to celebrate the fact that we're here, that we're resilient, that we struggle. And kind of going forward, thinking about the kinds of things that are necessary. One, obviously, solidarity. I think, I think. There's absolutely need for solidarity. Sometimes I think uh, indigenous movements, for example, are put kind of uh, pitched against sort of like black movement. I think, and in places like the Caribbean, where you have indigenous peoples and black peoples, ultimately we're fighting the same kind of forces. So we need to really, you know, build that solidarity. I think that's it's really important. Um, the, obviously, how do we think of our future from our own thoughts? Okay, how do we liberate? our own thinking to imagine an alternative future that is not, you know, linked to the exploit and exploitative kind of global capitalist system. Those are things uh, that for me, you know, are, are important when I think about emancipation 2020. Wow, yes, 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 yes. Big, big emphasis on the solidarity. Um, and solidarity, of course, also meaning that we are learning and being open to learning um, and growing with with others and with folks that are not of our culture and of our ethnicity, because uh, it's vitally important um, because we literally we have to be able to do this together. Right. Um, and I always bring up the example of Cuba whenever I hear about solidarity or international solidarity, um, because they were just so beautiful at that. So. Um, willing and ready to go out and, you know, support wherever it's needed. Um, and that's just the kind of vibe that, 
yeah, whenever I think of emancipation, I also think solidarity because um, I think that that's so key and so major. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna pass it off, please. Next panelist. All right. Um, so um, you're hearing me clearly, yes? Yes. Ah, okay. Wonderful. Right. Yes. So, um, yeah. I want to start by thanking you so much, um, the Caribbean Solidarity Network, in terms of um, inviting me to this. Um, I've been aware of the uh, tremendous work that you've been doing over the few years, and I'm really glad to be able to do an event with you. And to get to the heart of the matter, all that is happening now. <laughs> Let's understand that there are serious questions of existence that face the Caribbean. They existed before COVID and they're put into even starker relief with um, COVID. And these are existential questions which are stark and unprecedented, which I am going to uncover and work with a bit. Um, and often when we think about these questions of existential threats, as a very great um, Caribbean political economist, Norman Gervan, put it, we often think in the realm of the economy and the fragile state of Caribbean economies. And of course, there's a lot of great concern to be have about many aspects of Caribbean economies, things like the rising indebtedness, um, economic marginalization, fiscal colonialism, um, economic predation and vulnerability. All of these kinds of things are of um, great concern to us. We know the histories behind this. We know the history of the way in which the Caribbean went from largely monocultural agricultural economies to a situation in which they're um, driven by two great forces now, tourism and emigration. In a number of Caribbean countries, the greatest um, form of uh, foreign exchange earnings are actually remittances, um, or it's second only to tourism. So um, we're faced with the Caribbean, which in the last couple of decades, any notion of self-determination and sovereignty has become so shambolic, so um, piffy, so unlikely to actually exist. Um, uh, Michael Witter, the Jamaican economist, once asked, um, uh, and I paraphrase, are we going to be consumer appendages of North America, financed by remittances, drug transshipments, tourism, offshore services, with all the attendant effects that this actually has for Caribbean economies and Caribbean societies. So all of this has been the perennial problem in the Caribbean um, uh, since at least the advent of neocolonialism. Um, in a way, we have always been um, <laughs> living in a particular kind of state of emergency. And um, it's funny even to think about the phrase state of emergency because um, in the context of the 1970s, these would have been imposed by repressive uh, regimes when they wanted to manor populations within the Caribbean. But now state of emergency has actually become the norm. So you have a situation in Jamaica, and um, I um, do forgive me audience if I'm a little um, loose on the specifics here because I haven't followed that situation as closely as perhaps I should. But um, there are parts of Jamaica that have been under state of emergency now for I think about close to a couple of years, okay? It is an ongoing thing in large swathes of Jamaica due to the actual crime problem. So um, we have all of this such as actually happening now, all of these existential threats and problems. Um, but then of course, we had the advent in the last three years of the most incredible series of hurricanes in terms of the hurricane seasons that we've had, um, uh, which have caused so much anguish, death and destruction across the Caribbean. And of course, um, one of the very frightening things about um, uh, the environmental questions this raises, which I'll come to in a moment, is the fact of the intensity of the hurricanes. Um, in 2017, I think at one point, there were three category five hurricanes in the Caribbean at one moment in time. The behavior of the hurricanes, um, I believe it was Dorian last year in the Bahamas, it actually sat on one of the islands, okay, for a period of over 24 hours. So you're watching it on the map and you're actually seeing this hurricane moving at zero miles per hour. OK, this category five hurricane moving at zero miles per hour, sitting on the island in a way that no one had actually really seen or experienced before. And then, of course, there's also the strange tracks of the hurricane. So literally a few days ago, um, the tropical storm, again, um, uh, Renako can correct me on this. I it either hit Tobago or sideswiped Tobago, um, but 
what was really amazing for most of us watching the trajectory of the storm is the fact that we don't consider Trinidad and Tobago to be in any way part of the hurricane belt. In other words, Tobago might get hit like once in about 70 years by a hurricane, um, but actually gets hit at this time and so early in the season. So all of these um, raise a number of huge questions for Caribbean existence and whether the Caribbean is actually really going to survive the century in the way that we know it. And this is a serious question. This is not an apocalyptic vision. This is a serious question of whether the Caribbean will actually exist um, in another couple of generations. And this is, of course, all tied to one of the major big things I want to put on the table here, which is the environmental question. Um, and the environmental question is, of course, a question which raises a great deal of consternation um, and um, despair for a lot of us, especially since we feel so marginal to a, a, a particular solution on this. If the whole Caribbean went green, that's not going to make any difference, really, um, in terms of the way that global warming um, uh, actually is working. However, um, one of the things that has also come out of the environmental question and the tragedies that we've experienced in the last few years has been the incredible outpouring of Caribbean solidarity. But not just a Caribbean solidarity between people, but it has alerted us again if we needed any reminder of the importance of Caribbean regional institutions, um, uh, disaster networks, University of West Indies, the Caribbean Development Bank, in actually allowing people to be rescued and actually to survive. Um, so the persons out there who will say laconically, oh, you know, there is no such thing as Caribbean regionalism are the only Caribbean regional institutions are the University of West Indies and the West Indies cricket team and the West Indies cricket team ain't doing nothing now. Well, you know, I mean, that's actually really a fundamental misnomer. It's incorrect. And it's incorrect because there are so many Caribbean regional institutions that do a tremendous amount of work of uniting these spaces and actually helping each of us um, uh, to survive. And I think that um, the one thing that the environmental question has thrown up into sh uh, sharp relief is how dependent we are on these institutions. And hopefully that will not mean that we will understand what it takes to uh, perpetuate it. And we will give the resources to perpetuate it. The second thing I want to put on the agenda and on the table is, of course, reparations and reparatory justice for the crimes of colonialism, which, of course, has been given a great fill up and a great new energy by what has been happening with Black Lives Movement um, uh, and the various interconnected movements that are taking place um, throughout the world on this. Um, I mean, I remember 20 years ago when persons like myself used to say, you know, um, in your early 20s about, uh, yes, you know, we should get reparations for slavery. People used to look at you as if you were insane, as if you were saying the stupid, impractical, most nonsensical thing. That's a commonplace position on uh, by many who would be just left of center now. OK, but it was an extreme left position to even articulate it. Um, it was, it was um, almost seen as being crazy 20 years ago. So we have come away, um, even though there is a lot further to go. The third thing would, of course, be the question of gender justice and the commitment to gender justice that we need to have in the region. Um, it's um, over the last generation, the most important impact in terms of Caribbean activism, the changes to Caribbean scholarship, the ways in which we see the world have come out of a tremendous genre-defying set of women on Caribbean women's lives, on behalf of Caribbean women, on um, changing the very um, masculinist culture to the Caribbean and creating something new out of it. This is work which stands at the center of any leftist movement in the Caribbean and needs to be perpetuated and needs to be supported. And it stands also as one of our major flanks when we, planks when we think about any question of emancipation today. Um, there is also the question, fourthly, of a destruction of capitalism. Um, socialism or barbarism, that old slogan, is a living slogan for our time. Um, there will never be any social justice under capitalism. I know some of us would like to believe that we can tweak with it and we can do this, but there is no social justice under capitalism. There is no black 
are poor enfranchisement of workers under capitalism. That's not how capitalism is built. So um, the world will also have to make a choice for socialism because, and of course, all of these things are connected. The kind of environmental questions that we are faced with cannot be resolved through capitalism. <laughs> They're not going to be resolved through green capitalism. That's simply not what is going to be uh, possible. Um, fifthly, I would say a voice to the world for peace. Um, and um, we must never um, underestimate the um, encircling and the need uh, of imperialism that the Caribbean has faced throughout its existence, but also the ways in which new Cold Wars, new hostilities are being fashioned at this very moment. And the Caribbean as a voice for peace, um, um, of course, has tremendous resonance, as we saw last year with the Venezuela situation. And then lastly, and to complete, but of great importance, something which, and I said that all of these things are connected, but encompasses all of these, is the question of black consciousness. And black consciousness um, means that, as Fanon said, um, each generation has to discover its mission and either fulfill it or betray it. And part of that means that each generation anew has to learn their history, has to um, learn how to decode anti-Black images, has to understand the nature of what colonialism and neocolonialism mean for its time, and have to be allied to a project, and resolutely allied to a project of third world liberation, which also um, involves itself with Blackness, but um, also um, reaches beyond it. And uh, the particularly important part of the struggle that Black consciousness gives third world liberation is what um, uh, Sylvia Winter once wrote, the great Jamaican um, theorist and critic. She once said that Black people have paid the highest psycho-existential price for the contemporary Euro-American West dominance. And uh, that is a captivating phrase because we have. We have paid the highest psycho-existential price for Euro-American dominance, and we have to be the uh, key to um, undoing that dominance. And that's what I think of as some of the most important features of the Caribbean at this moment in this conjuncture, Emancipation Day 2020. Ooh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, covered literally every single point. Um, and I'm so happy that you brought up the, the climate change question. Um, and then also the conversation on gender, because so many, you, as you were saying, so many amazing uh, women um, and, and femmes just doing real good work um, in terms of, of, keeping, of keeping folks safe in the Caribbean. So um, I'm going to ask one more question uh, a little bit. Um, and then if there are questions from the audience, please feel free to, to send them in the chat and we will read them out to the panelists. Um, but our second question is is kind of a, an extension of our first question. Um, but what does emancipation look like in the 21st century? A lot of you, a lot of the panelists have, have kind of answered this question, but um, what are concrete activities um, that we can invest in to ensure a greater sense of freedom in the coming years, especially in the Caribbean? So um, this can be on a macro level, right? You know, that in terms of laws, uh, financial, uh, you know, bailouts from, you know, governments that were profiting off of the transatlantic slave trade and, and whatnot. Um, but it can also be micro, right? What can folks be doing in their daily life that speaks to the work of emancipation um, and, you know, just dismantling, honestly, capitalism, as, you know, Dr. Aaron was saying, like dismantling these these structures and and helping to teach, you know, folks around us on on what liberation and what emancipation really truly is. So maybe if folks have a just, you know, just something that they can kind of leave our audience with. Um, in terms of the topic of emancipation and about emancipation in our future and in our present, uh, that would be fantastic. So I'm going to leave it out to whoever would like to go first. I was gonna say, okay. do I have to pick somebody? <laughs> okay, let, let me um, let me jump jump in. Um, 
I think a lot in terms of the work that I'm involved in. That's kind of where I think from, right? And for the last 20 years or so, I have been uh, affiliated with the indigenous movement, Maya movement in Belize. Um, in mid-90s, the Maya people of Belize organized themselves to fight incursions into their lands by logging companies who had gotten licenses from the state. So essentially a capitalist state granting, granting licenses to logging companies to come and extract lumber, totally disregarding the fact that these are indigenous lands. It's a familiar story. Okay. And uh, they had to engage in this. And in 2015, they obtained a uh, Caribbean court just Court of Justice ruling. So the first in the Caribbean Court of Justice that affirmed the Maya people's rights to land. And I think that's a really great achievement. Okay. Uh, the challenge, of course, when you go to court is that you begin to think of things in legal terms. Right? And self-determination, emancipation is not a legal question. Right? Uh, so for indigenous peoples, uh, it's about living you know, on the land, about defending uh, indigenous ways of knowing, being, and, and doing. Um, but the, 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 the Maya people have been pretty clear. You know, you hear often uh, leaders talk about, you know, it's not about land as a real estate, okay? Uh, but defining themselves as what they call real church, as people of the land, people who depend, who care, you know, who live on the land. So it's in their relationship with the land uh, that is really important. So one of the things that we have been talking about lately in, in conversations here with some of the leaders and colleagues is what does indigeneity mean going forward? What does Ral Chaj mean going forward? Right. Um, and that, I think, is the task. Right? How do we define ourselves? What is going to be the relationship that we're going to have with the land and with each other? That seems to be a really important question. So. One of the things that I've seen happening here is that indigenous peoples are working on imagining a future, right? A future that is reaches into their heritage, but it's open to all kinds of possibilities. Uh, to me, that's the most exciting thing. And I think it, it, it involves many of the things that we have been talking about, even responding to the question of gender and climate change. So how, do, how are we going to relate to them? Because ultimately, the challenge of climate change, those environmental issues that we're facing, are the result of the economic system that we have been carrying on, colonialism and the, the economic system that have been established. Um, so we have to really imagine something outside of that. We have to dismantle uh, capitalism. You're absolutely, absolutely right. And um, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I think it's one of the things that we have to do. We have to reach into that heritage. Uh, we have to think ourselves from ourselves. Right? We have to think about the Caribbean from the Caribbean. And that really requires stepping out of the box and thinking crazy ideas uh, like reparation, which may seem crazy, but you know what? That's the only way that actually we're going to make progress. Um, I'm sitting here on somebody else's desk, but I see uh, this uh, document. I don't know whether you can see it, um, but it, it says here, the, the future we dream, okay? Which is a, an output of an, of an exercise that the Maya people collectively engaged in involving women, young people, and men to think, who are we? Three basic questions. Who are we? was one of the questions. Where are we now? And what is our dream for the future? And this initiative made use of, you know, arts-based methods. They produced drawings. They drew uh, stuff. They imagined the future. And it's amazing what came out of that and it energized kind of the movement. I really think that, especially when it comes to indigenous peoples, often indigenous peoples are imagined as people of the past, okay? Uh, barely imagined as people of the present, they're kind of invisible, and definitely not thought of as people of the future. Uh, but I see indigenous peoples as future makers, and the same thing, I think, uh, with black people, the, 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 the future makers, and we have to see ourselves in terms of that, and reaching out, in, reaching into that wealth uh, of resources that we have, uh, to imagine an alternative that overcomes those issues that we kind of talked about today. Anybody else, please feel free to jump in. 
Um, I just jump in by making a couple of points. Um, additionally, um, I love the last points about indigenous people as people of the future and not of the past. There's so much. I thought the way that that was put, you know, and uh, um, the way that the stereotype works and moving beyond that is so important. Um, in terms of tangible things, um, it all. Um, one of the most important things, of course, becomes consciousness and the various ways in which consciousness then can work on a community um, a level. Um, I was reminded just now of Lloyd Bess's grand comment when he said, I dream of being involved in a grand Caribbean susu. OK, and of course, Lloyd Bess, the great um, Trinidadian economist, meant um, he could see a Caribbean in which um, was operating as one economy in which the different national states were sharing and helping with each other, each giving the best that they had to a project of regional liberation. Um, but I think I also thought about that point because in deepening Caribbean integration and deepening Caribbean self-determination, because we all understand it's not a project that will succeed overnight. Um, one of the things that COVID has thrown into sharp relief with the destruction of so many economies and the cutting off of certain trade links is a vital issue of food security. Now, um, the US Department of Agriculture once about 10 years ago rated the Caribbean as being the most food um, import dependent region in the world. And uh, that is a shocking and a shameful legacy that the Caribbean would be the most food import dependent region in the world. And um, it has grave consequences for food security, because if you cannot eat, what kind of sovereignty, what kind of self-determination can you have as a people? And um, I'm thinking also across to George Laming, I think um, popularizes his great comments about food and agriculture being um, the root of culture, okay? Um, because it's a cultural experience that we participate in several times a day. So um, that question of food security, which so many families have come to understand um, and of course, very unfortunately, on a very viscero level, um, as a result of the pandemic, is important because it's something Hello? that people can address on a personal level, on a community level, on a national level, and also on a regional level. No, no, no. It has he, to be addressed um, in those kinds of ways. Uh, so um, I am not her to come a big um, romantic around the, the idea of the kitchen stuff. garden and all of that. So I will not tarry you with that because most families are simply not going to be WhatsApp able to make here. any physical um, contribution to their food needs to, by, you know, planting the kitchen garden. Okay, so I'm not going down those lines. But I'm saying though still that this question of food security, this question of um, how food, um, the most basic and the most important product for like products, gets produced, what we consume, what economies we actually support, what does this mean for our personal consciousness, our national consciousness? Um, all of those are some of the things which I think um, is certainly not the only, but one of the most important moments that um, we can start with and we can really think about. Because it's something that none of us escapes because we all um, need to eat to survive. And then maybe Runako, you can kind of finish us. Unless, no, Hello? okay. Um, I'm just gonna see if we have any questions from the audience really quickly. Um, uh, no? Yeah, it doesn't look like there's any questions from the, oh, sorry, Philip Rosso, did you wanna say something, please? Uh, no, but I, I um... Well, I said no, and I'm saying something. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about the, the question of of uh, food security. You know, I think it's a really important uh, 
question. Uh, I like the two issues that, that um, raise about climate change and uh, food security. I think that they pose uh, existential threats, right? Um, that need to be addressed. That's one of the things that I said that I'm, not, I'm excited about, and I think for I, I think a lot in terms of working with indigenous people, which obviously is sort of like a different reality, despite the fact that in certain places, you know, indigenous peoples are also very urban. Um, for at least in the case of Belize, indigenous peoples continue to live in kind of rural areas. Food is a big question, right? Um, and COVID certainly, you know, showed that, you know, as you said, you know, putting shy relief. And you have the question of climate change, you know, that makes it even harder to produce food. So there's a lot of uh, talk about, you know, how do we rebuild our economies for indigenous peoples, not in terms of thinking, what do we produce to sell? Okay, yes, certainly we need to generate income, but also how do we uh, sustain ourselves? There's a sense of, of the question of self-reliance, which obviously makes sense in, in maybe indigenous spaces that are uh, rural areas. Uh, but I think um, it's something important and I'm not sure, I, I have a hard time thinking about, you know, in the urban spaces, what is it that we, that we can do? Is it a matter of connecting within our countries, you know, the urban centers with the rural uh, areas much more closely? Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of having a hard time to think about it, but I know it is a major issue uh, that we have to contend. And I kind of wanted to throw back the, the question, say, well, you know, what are some things that we might be able to do kind of in the urban spaces in terms of the question of food security? Yeah, that's a big one. And I know that um, this has just been a, a conversation that we've recently started having in terms of my friend group anyway, where a lot of my friends have been getting involved in community gardens and, you know, that concept of, of producing your own food and farming your own food um, and being able to cultivate um, just your own ability to create your own food. Um, so that, that is such a beautiful question. I wonder... Um, I wonder if, if the the rise in interest in community gardens and you know individual gardening has a lot to do with that, um, with this question of, of food insecurity in urban spaces. Um, Rinakwa, I see you have your your mute off. Did you want to jump in? No, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Okay, so we have a question actually from the audience for Filiberto. Um, so. It is, it, so this is a question. It is true that for some of us, we are both indigenous and black, though some are less willing to acknowledge that. How can we reckon with the role black folks and black led states have played in contributing to anti-indigenous racism and erasure in the region and move to a place of active and deep black and indigenous solidarity? Big question, but beautiful question. It is a big question and <laughs> one that I'm don't, not sure that I have an answer for. But I do think, as I said kind of earlier, um, you know, sometimes in, in, especially, you know, in a place like Belize and probably like Guyana that has a very large indigenous population, right? Um, maybe less so in some of the other Caribbean countries. If you think about Jamaica, I'm not sure about indigenous people. So I know that in some of the, like Trinidad, you can, talk about uh, some indigenous peoples there. But in places like Guyana and Belize, I think sometimes there's a tendency to pitch these two kind of struggles, uh, almost as, as competing, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure competing, well, or, or, or in conflict with each other. Um, and in a sense, I think we tend to forget that we're fighting a common enemy. Right. I'll, I'll put it this way. I was at uh, an interview on television um, <clears throat> at maybe last year or so at the relaunch of the Belize National Indigenous Council in which, for example, we have Garifuna uh, people who are indigenous people. They're Afro-indigenous peoples. And so one of the questions was, well, you know, the inclusion of the Garifuna people, kind of black, black people in the Belize National Indigenous Council, is it kind of like a token, you know? 
uh, to say, you know, black people are also in, indigenous. Uh, and what about the people kind of in the streets of Billy City, okay? Um, isn't kind of the indigenous movement and the land rights kind of asking for a bigger part of the pie at the expense of other people? And so I, I posed the question, I said, well, okay, imagine if the lands that the Maya people are struggling for, right, was made available to whoever would like to get a piece of land there. Do you think that it would be a black person in Southside Belize City, is kind of one of the most impoverished areas in Belize City, is going to get that piece of land? Right. And of course, the answer is no. Right. So who will get that land? Okay. And that land is probably going to be obtained by a large company, wealthy people, foreigners. So ultimately, the black person walking the south side uh, streets of Belize City and indigenous peoples in kind of very remote uh, Toledo are ultimately fighting a common enemy, okay? Which is, as I said, kind of the very logic of colonialism and capitalism that continues to marginalize them, okay? Now, our states have perpetrated that. I mean, if you think about the Belizean state of any of our states, in a sense, there are white states. I mean, the, the, the governance system, the political system, is rests on colonial kind of ideologies. So they sustain that. So to me, they have played a major role in, in that, right? And sometimes they play people against, against each other. So to me, there's, a, there's also a need for a kind of healing and recognizing that we are all victims. You know, we spoke about indentureship, enslavement, and dispossession. We are people who have suffered under that kind of same uh, oppressive system. So how do we build that kind of solidarity, right, that allows us to see that we're fighting a common fight um, in, in different kinds of ways? So one, definitely I think the states have played and continue to play a major r role in sustaining that kind of violence, that kind of system, uh, pitching people against each, uh, against each other, and hence a need for being able to see across that, being able to see across that. Um, I teach a class in development and indigeneity, okay? <clears throat> and uh, one of the questions sometimes that is posed, well, you know, uh, Afro-descendants, indigenous peoples, okay? Um, and it can become a controversial issue, right? And saying, well, of course, uh, in the case of Belize, we're talking about Creole people, Garifuna people, they are all Belizeans, right? But that doesn't take away from the fact that these lands were Maya lands and Maya people were dispossessed, okay? We have to recognize that as much as we have to recognize that, you know, uh, black people were enslaved, and the capitalist system was built on the backs of slavery. So to me, recognizing that, recognizing kind of the common suffering, recognizing the forces actually that we're fighting, which are similar no matter where we stand, I think it's really important. So I don't know if she, if she if she could hear us if our, if our camera is down um, or what. Ah yes, um, I think our moderator is frozen. You were saying, Renato. Yeah, yeah. I, I think she might. I think she might be frozen. <laughs> um. I guess maybe until uh, she she's able to come back, um, I, I will just jump on on on, on the, the previous question about things that, that we could do uh, moving forward. And, you know, Aaron, you, you describe like a lot of things, um, a lot of different things that, that need to be addressed or that can be addressed. And, um, I, I, and, and but, but I think obviously at the macro level we think about the the impact of capitalism and and like how do we get do the work to 
um, to tear that down? And um, how do we deal with things like like even food security? These are these are a lot of things that that seem to be only possible um, of addressing from from a macro level. Mm. And although I, I would say that 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 it is important to, to advocate for, uh, for for these structures to change and to, to push our governments to to have um, different relationships, different trade relationships, different um, policy I initiatives such that, that there will be less reliance, for example, on food coming outside of the um, coming outside of the region. I, I think we could encourage our governments, for example, to engage in regional trade um, to help secure food um, food w w within the, uh, like across the region. I think that that is entirely possible uh, uh, um, conversation or, or something that, that we could get behind and advocate on behalf of. But I also think, on a micro level, there is there's a lot of work that that can be done too, and um, even something like indigenous and African, Indian, whatever solidarity. I I I, I think that that there could be more attempts to try to build um, solidarity. Island nation states, uh, or, or or mainland states. Um, within the region, I, I think that there are, um, they, they, we, we can build solidarity within the states and across the region as well. So trying to identify others who other, whether you want to call them progressives, leftists, radicals, who have the same idea in mind in terms of trying to um, imagine a new society. And, and I think that is really uh, where we want to be when we deal with people on the micro level is try to imagine where we could be right because because right now the the analysis the way that that we uh um i guess envision ourselves in in, in the caribbean is to compare it to north america europe and, 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 and north america so we have this very western ideal of of where our society should be and and trying to get away from that or trying to imagine something different is uh, is, is really important. But, but I think it, the work needs to be done on a grassroots level, on on that micro level. And it, and it means um, getting to like, like with communities within communities in, um, in, in our, our nation states and um, trying to, to engage in things like, like political education and, and um, just, just his, uh, and obviously learning more about about our history and and what that means for us and what it could mean for us moving forward, and um, that I mean there there are so many things that that that, that we could try and, and tackle, but I think it's also to recognize that that we all have a contribution to make and and to, to start to think about what contribution are we going to make to for the cause of of real liberation right of, of, of a real um decolonial <laughs> uh status quo um to, to, to put it in a, in a way right so i, I think it, it, it's really a lot of times it, it could seem as this is this is like it has so much to do like it has so many things like how are we gonna deal with you know it have the, the police beating me up in the streets um, you know, the, we have food security issues. We have, you know, um, the, the the lending institutions that are, that are taking advantage of uh, of of these, you know, countries within the Caribbean. We have all of these different issues, so it could seem like such a, a huge task to try and take on. Um, but, but I think it is important for us. You know, we could identify. You know, like Aaron did at the beginning. There have a lot of different things that are happening. And, and, and we could insert ourselves in any one of these different areas to uh, try to bring about the change that, that, um, that we want to see and, and to help to construct a future that, that, um, that we believe is possible, uh, which will be anti-colonial, which will be um, anti-capitalist, and which will bring justice to those who have been um, oppressed in this region for centuries and 
So yeah, I, I, I would just say that. And then again, just trying to, to build connections with, across the region and across the world, in fact, because because this fight against capitalism, against imperialism, against um, uh, colonialism is is not just within the Caribbean region. Obviously, the um, the uh, you know throughout the, the, the so-called global south, we have a situation where uh, where people are faced with similar circumstances. So. I, I think on a micro level, there, there, there's something that we could all do. Fantastic. Does anybody else have any last words that they want to say? OK. Um, so I, I'm, yeah, Aaron, please. Sorry. Oh, um, very quickly then, I would just say that um, and in echoing parts of what Yun Renako said, it is at these moments in which so many horrible things are actually happening and there's so much destruction and so much chaos that paradoxically people are most in search of solutions and most receptive to solutions which um, fundamentally address the root problems of what um, is wrong with our societies. So, um, the very tragedy of our times can be an advantage in imagining new and more um, uh, humane ways of living in the world. Yay, and with that being said, um, that concludes today's event. Thank you so much to everybody for coming. Thank you to all of our amazing panelists. This conversation was mwah, chef's kiss. Um, I, as a way to wrap up this event, I'm hoping that, you know, um, folks kind of take what was what was said on the panel, but also just kind of doing that, you know, self-reflection work and figuring out what emancipation means to you. Um, and, you know, doing whatever is necessary to kind of implement that in your daily life and, um, you know, incorporate that in, in your own career, in your professional life, your academic life, whatever the case is. Um, and if you can take the time, you know, on August 1st or 31st or whenever, uh, to commemorate and to celebrate um, emancipation um, and the legacy of our ancestors. I think that would be phenomenal. So again, thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Continue to stay safe. Wear your PPE uh, and don't be around more than 10 people. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a wonderful time. Thank you, guys. Yes. Bye.